Like the male's reproductive system, the female reproductive system produces sex hormones and gametes. But it also is responsible for protecting and supporting a developing embryo, more on this in chapter 20, and it nourishes a newborn infant. The principal organs of the female reproductive system are the ovaries, the uterine tubes, the uterus, the vagina, and the components of the external genitalia. As in males, there is a variety of accessory glands that release secretions into the female reproductive tract as well. The ovaries are located near the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity, and they're stabilized by a broad ligament and supporting ligaments. The ovaries are responsible for the production of immature gametes called ova, secretion of the female sex hormones including estrogens and progestins, and they also produce the hormone inhibin. Oogenesis is the production of an ovum, which begins when the female is still a developing fetus in her mother's uterus and continues until menopause. Notice how this figure has three main stages like spermatogenesis did. The production begins when an oogonia, an egg stem cell, undergoes mitosis in, and again remember this is in utero, uh, before birth, which produces a primary oocyte, which will then undergo meiosis one, and this usually happens during puberty of the individual, and this produces secondary oocytes. Now secondary oocytes do not undergo meiosis two until they're fertilized by a sperm. Let's discuss follicular development. So a primordial follicle is a primary oocyte that's surrounded by a single layer of follicular cells. A primary follicle is when the cells enlarge and divide and produce estrogen. The secondary follicle is when the wall of the follicle thickens, secretes fluid, and that fluid will accumulate in pockets. The secondary follicle matures through a 28-day cycle, which is called the follicular phase, and it takes about 14 days for the follicular phase. And during this time, follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates formation of a tertiary follicle. So the tertiary follicle is formed by days 10 to 14-ish of the ovarian cycle. And the oocyte projects into the central chamber of the follicle, the anterum. This, and then when you have increases in luteinizing hormone, it'll prompt the completion of meiosis one, which will produce the secondary oocyte in the pelvic cavity, and the oocyte enters the uterine tubes. The remaining 14 days of the ovarian cycle is the luteal phase, where an empty follicle will collapse and develop into an endocrine structure called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is responsible for secreting progesterone. Now, without fertilization of the ovum, the corpus luteum will degenerate into the corpus albicans, and this will mark the end of a full ovarian cycle. Follicle stimulating hormone will rise to initiate another ovarian cycle. Yep, there's the corpus albicans labeled for you. So after being released from the ovary, the secondary oocyte will enter the female reproductive tract at the uterine tubes, also called the fallopian tubes or oviducts. The infundibulum is expanded and closest to the ovary and has fimbrae or finger-like projections of the infundibulum. In the tract, cilia help propel the oocyte into the uterine tube towards the uterus. The oocyte also moves through the uterine tubes by peristalsis of the smooth muscle there. The uterus is a pear-shaped muscular organ in the pelvic cavity. It tips anteriorly over the urinary bladder 
and provides mechanical protection and nutritional support for embryonic and fetal development. The uterus consists of two regions, the body of the uterus and the cervix of the uterus. The body is composed of a fundus of uterus, which is an area above the attachments of the uterine tubes, and the isthmus, which is a narrowing of the body at the inferior end. The cervix projects into the vagina. The internal os is the opening between the body and the cervix, and the external os is the opening into the vagina. The uterine wall has three layers, the endometrium, which is the functional zone of epithelial lining that undergoes changes and is the layer that's sloughed off as part of the uterine cycle, but the base layer layer remains intact. The myometrium is the muscular layer that contracts during labor and delivery. And the perimetrium is the visceral peritoneum of this organ. The uterine cycle, more commonly known as the menstrual cycle, is a repeating series of changes in the structure of the endometrium of the uterus. It functions to prepare the uterine lining for the implantation of a fertilized ovum called a zygote. The first uterine cycle occurs with the menarche at puberty, and the cycle continues until menopause, the last menstrual cycle. The regular appearance of the menstrual cycle is interrupted only by circumstances such as illness, stress, starvation, or pregnancy. The uterine cycle averages 28 days, uh, but can range from 21 to 35 days, and consists of three phases. The menses is the dinner degeneration of the functional zone of the endometrium, where arteries constrict and secretory glands and epithelial cells die. This is triggered by a drop in progesterone and estrogen, which leads to menstruation. The blood and the dead cells pass through and out the vagina. The proliferative phase begins at the completion of menses and increases in ovarian estrogen and when you have increases in ovarian estrogen, that'll trigger the repair and the growth of the endometrium. You'll have an increase in vascularization during this phase and development of nutritional secretory glands um, as the functional zone becomes several millimeters thick. The secretory phase begins at ovulation. The uterine glands enlarge and it prepares the endometrium for the developing embryo. This is stimulated by progestins and estrogens from the corpus luteum. And as the corpus luteum degenerates, the uterine cycle will end and menses will begin again. The vagina is an elastic muscular tube that's parallel and anterior to the rectum, just posterior to the urethra. It functions as a passageway for menstrual fluid and receives the penis and holds semen during intercourse. It makes up the lower portion of the birth canal as well. This figure depicts the sagittal section of the vagina and notice there is a fornix structure which is a shallow recess surrounding the base of the cervix. Whereas this picture depicts the external genitalia. The vagina opens into the vestibule, the hymen, is an epithelial fold that partially blocks the vaginal entrance. The urethral opening is just anterior to the vaginal opening. The clitoris is a small portion of erectile tissue that's anterior to the urethral opening. And the vestibule is bound by the labia minora, which is covered with smooth hairless skin. An extension of the labia minora covers the clitoris with a prepuce or a hood. The lesser and greater vestibular glands moisten and lubricate the region. The mons pubis and the labia majora are the outer area that protects the vestibule. The mammary glands are located in the breasts. They function in lactation or milk production. Glands are surrounded by adipose tissue and they're supported by ligaments. They, their secretion is collected into ductules that converged into the lactiferous duct, which drain into the lactiferous sinus, which opens into the body surface of the nipple. 
The areola is the brownish skin that surrounds the nipple. The hormones of the anterior pituitary gland govern ovarian cycles. They regulate secretions of ovarian hormones and provide feedback to the hypothalamus. Hormones of the ovaries are going to govern the uterine cycles and provide feedback to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which has two effects on the anterior pituitary gland, production and secretion of follicle-stimulating hormone and the production of luteinizing hormone. Notice, not secretion, just the production. So this will trigger the start of the follicular phase of the ovary, and some secondary follicles develop into a tertiary follicle. The follicular cells secrete two hormones in Hibin to reduce the follicle-stimulating hormone so that only one follicle develops at a time, and estrogens, which have many effects. And you can see those listed here. Eventually, around day 10, enough estrogen is present to stimulate the luteinizing hormone surge from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So this luteinizing hormone surge triggers ovulation. The follicular cells will enter the luteal phase and become luteal cells in the corpus luteum and then eventually the corpus albicans. The luteal cells no longer secrete estrogen, they secrete progesterone now, which plays two important roles. It stimulates the secretory phase of the uterine cycle and provides negative feedback to the hypothalamus. Now, if pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum degenerates, progesterone declines, and gonadotropin-releasing hormone is no longer inhibited, and it starts it all over again. So that brings us to the first checkpoint of this recording. The next section looks at sexual intercourse, also called coitus or copulation, which is the process that introduces semen into the female reproductive tract. This requires coordination of reflexes of the autonomic nervous system. We'll start with males first. Male sexual function is coordinated by reflex pathways involving both divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So it occurs in three phases. Uh, Arousal is the first, which is triggered by erotic thoughts or sensory nerve stimulation of the genital region. Parasympathetic activity leads to the erection and to the engorgement of the erectile tissue. Emission is the next step, which occurs under sympathetic stimulation. Peristalsis of the ductus deferens move fluid and spermatozoa to the ejaculatory duct, and contraction of the seminal vesicles in the prostate gland move the semen to the urethra. Ejaculation results from the contraction of the ischiocavernosis in the bulbosponginosis skeletal pelvic floor muscles. Orgasm is a pleasurable sensation associated with the ejaculation. Female sexual function is comparable to that in males with arousal uh, being responsible from the parasympathetic activity which leads to engorgement of the clitoris and vestibular bulbs and increased secretion of the cervical mucus glands. During intercourse, orgasm is typically accompanied by contraction of skeletal pelvic floor muscles and can lead to peristaltic contractions of the uterine and vaginal walls. After puberty, changes in the male reproductive system occur very gradually over a long period of time. However, in females' reproductive system, menopause is a major age-related event. Menopause is defined as the time that ovulation and menstruation cease, though it occurs at ages 45 to 55, the ovarian and menstrual cycles become irregular in the years preceding it. This time frame is called perimenopause, and it begins around age 40. It's caused by a shortage of follicles. Menopause then is when there are no longer any follicles left to respond to follicle stimulating hormone. So with the lack of follicular cells comes a decline in estrogen and progesterone, which reduces the size of female reproductive structures. Again, the age-related changes in males occur much more gradually 
as levels of testosterone can decline, but sperm production will still continue. However, the sperm may not be as viable as they once were. And that brings us to the conclusion of chapter 19.